want to uh, to welcome everybody this evening. And uh, we have quite a good crowd with additional seating in the back if necessary. But uh, as a community effort, we greatly appreciate everyone uh, joining us this evening. This is the, uh, the second of perhaps a series uh, to be decided when we get done to see where we're at. But a second uh, community-wide meeting we've had. The first was about a month ago. And uh, good turnout. Um, we started with uh, a, a staff report. It took about an hour, talking about the various things that have taken place, where we're at, what we're doing. It's a work in progress. So where we were at that at that point. And then for the balance of the evening, another hour uh, public uh, input. Quite a number of people spoke, asked a number of good questions. Uh, we didn't have a, t a chance to answer those questions, but certainly accumulated them. And so this evening, we're going to, to do several things. First, picking up from where we left off, uh, the staff and um, our city attorney will address the concerns and questions and issues, points of, points of order that came up at the last meeting, as a, like I said, as a continuation. Some very, very good questions. Again, we appreciate those uh, greatly to enhance our understanding as a community, where we're at and where we're going. And uh, we will then, uh, since the council members didn't have a, an opportunity to ask their own questions or perhaps uh, provide some input as to where they're at, what their thinking is, uh, we'll uh, have that this evening after the, uh, the, the um, presentation by staff of the questions we had previously had. And we get through that, and if there's time remaining, I'm presuming that there will be, we'll be concluding at 9 o'clock. If there's time remaining, uh, we certainly welcome any additional thoughts or input uh, that, that the community has, because this is a, it's a community project in many ways, and certainly has community impacts, and so we're, uh, we're just delighted you're here tonight to help us work our way through. This is not an easy one, and it does affect each and every one of us, so we uh, greatly appreciate your presence. If that works for you, we'll start with uh, staff report, and I think our our city attorney is going to address. And I'll read the question which came up at the last meeting, uh, and that is, what rights does Smart have to carry out their uh, Larkspur extension? Can San Rafael prevent the train from going to Larkspur? Uh, that was fairly fairly central to to where we branch off in terms of our our approach. So. Rob, Thank you, Rob Mr. Epstein, Mayor. if you could uh, address here. that. I know you're in the, way in the background, but uh, thanks for joining us this evening and help us with this issue. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the community. So uh, put simply, SMART owns uh, the right-of-way through San Rafael, and that extends from uh, the current terminus at 4th Street to Larkspur through the tunnel and all the way to Larkspur. So the second part of the question is, there's some way that San Rafael could lawfully prevent SMART from utilizing its right-of-way to operate its train service? The answer is no. The city and SMART, as well as the bridge district with regard to the transit center, have been engaged in a series of negotiations with regard to a number of issues. These include, first and foremost, the issue of the Anderson Drive crossing. That's been the subject of discussion and negotiation for years, and an application that uh, will probably be further discussed tonight by the gentleman to my left, for the city to enjoy an at-grade crossing at Anderson. That's something that uh, has been supported by SMART and uh, has been one of the issues that the city has negotiated with SMART. There have been collateral issues related to that, a property flip uh, and other matters that concern the extension of the train to Larkspur. Those negotiations have not uh, concluded. They continue to be underway. We expect to return to the council at an upcoming meeting with uh, agreements that would be the product of negotiations currently underway. And the fact that the city has uh, no power or lacks the authority to completely prevent the train from going to Larkspur does not mean that the city has no leverage whatsoever 
in the course of these negotiations. Rather, there are various points of leverage that the city has in which uh, it has utilized and uh, continues to utilize. I and my office supporting city manager and public works director to my left, who are the point people in the negotiations, uh, have been working with all of that as these two have been negotiating with their counterparts at both SMART and the Bridge District. So we'll continue that process. As I said, we had one agreement that came before the council and was approved on Monday night concerning the quiet zones. That is an agreement that the city reached with SMART and um, which will facilitate uh, what I know the community wants with the train, which is to have a quiet zone through San Rafael. So more agreements will be coming on your council agendas at upcoming meetings, and our office will continue to support those negotiations. Yeah, it's pretty clear, and, and, and thanks for uh, providing input on that particular question. Uh, council may have questions on each of the uh, subject matters that come up, but why don't we hold until uh, Bill, perhaps Jim as well, uh, presents the other questions that came up and, and the response. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm just going to read through the eight other questions that we have and provide the uh, response. I'll be doing a bit of reading here. Uh, there was a question about traffic. Uh, the interim transit center needs improved traffic analysis. Uh, the city should consider the number of buses parked on the streets, people transferring between buses, uh, bus driver routing changes, growth of traffic over time, and consider the backup on US 101 to local streets, and also consider the backup on 101 and on 101 drivers. So uh, our answer to that is that we consider much of this in our analysis, but the analysis was limited to a, an area covered around the transit uh, center itself. Uh, significant if issues not covered were growth over time and the impacts of further, uh, the, the further impacts away from the transit center, most notably on Highway 101 coming off the freeway. Uh, Golden Gate Transit is embarking on a much more significant environmental analysis of the transit center alternatives focused on the development of a permanent transit center, and they'll be required to study these impacts as part of that effort. So we have a, another question on traffic. Why assume the train misses the red light in your worst case scenario example? Uh, the worst case scenario example is assumed to be the train signaling road closure at or about the same time that the eastbound and westbound signals turn green. Uh, the east and westbound signals would immediately turn yellow and then red, causing the already backed up traffic to wait for an entire cycle of the light. Turning red, the mast arms coming down, the train crossing the street, the mast arms returning to the upright position, and the signal turning green again. This would be exacerbated by a signal turning immediately red again in order for the signals to resynchronize. So you could miss an entire uh, sequence of the green light in the worst case scenario. Uh, another traffic question, uh, when will the council review the West Francisco Boulevard flip designs? Uh, the Rice Drive intersection does not accommodate the, the multi-use path. Uh, the answer to that is the Francisco Boulevard flip has been presented to the city council. Uh, the most current design of the Rice Drive intersection has not been presented, nor has the city council formally approved either of those two things. Uh, the city believes that the Rice Drive intersection will accommodate the multi-use path and we've begun the design effort towards that goal. Uh, we will seek city council approval on this in the near future, possibly as soon as the March 20th uh, council meeting. Uh, there was a couple of parking questions. The first one is, what's the status of the downtown parking and wayfinding study and how will parking be managed around the downtown smart station? The parking and wayfinding study is in the draft final report phase with edits being made as we continue to gather public input. A working group comprised of various community stakeholders and key city staff began its series of meetings in early February. Uh, this group is reviewing each of the recommendations and the corresponding draft reports and meeting for two or three hour sessions to discuss and ideally arrive at a general consensus. Parking will be managed around the downtown smart station by implementing the study recommendations that the working group agrees upon. It's being recommended, rec recommended that parking services monitor the free time limited on street parking east of Highway 101 and Lincoln Avenue north of Fifth Avenue 
as well as the unrestricted on-street parking in the Montecito, Lincoln, San Rafael Hill, and Dominican uh, Black Canyon neighborhoods. Occupancy will, be, occupancy will be monitored by parking services staff and enforcement will be monitored by the parking services manager. So the other parking question is, how will parking work in the area? Is there enough parking? It's anticipated, sorry, it's being recommended in the parking and wayfinding study that the city anticipate a parking demand estimated at 30 or more spaces for the initial SMART opening. The study will recommend that these northbound SMART riders originating in downtown San Rafael be directed to one of three places. Uh, eight new 10-hour all-day meters, which will be changed from two-hour meters today, uh, on West Tamalpais Avenue between 4th Street and 5th Avenue. And we'll also direct them to the 3rd and Luton's parking structure. The upper le level is found to have a typical sur surplus of 21 spaces a day, and those are also long-term parking spaces. And the A Street garage would be the, uh, the last alternative. It's believed that between the above listed parking options, there is presently enough parking in the future smart station area to accommodate the station needs. Uh, several access questions came up. How or when will a permanent ADA accessible path be constructed for east and west pedestrian access under Highway 101 at the Civic Center Station? Uh, the Department of Public Works is developing, developing a proposal to construct an accessible path south of the tracks under Highway 101. DPW will pursue grant funding to support this construction or propose the construction project in a future capital investment program sub submittal to City Council. There are many competing needs for limited resources both within San Rafael and by those granting agencies so the path may not receive funding immediately. Another access question. In addition to ADA parking along Marydale Road, can there be a passenger drop-off on Civic Center Drive? A passenger drop-off was considered on the east side of Highway 101. It was not constructed due to the expensive cost of construction there and the potential to use the Marydale Road for accessible parking and kiss and ride functions. Smart's investment in construction on Marydale Road has the added benefit of jump-starting the development of the Northgate Promenade connection to the mall and DPW is working on design alternatives that accommodate the promenade. Uh, room is still available on the east side of the freeway for a drop-off in the location that was originally contemplated, uh, but we'll have to find funding for that in order to accommodate that in the future. Another access question, how and when will the multi-use path between North San Pedro Road and the Civic Center Station be built? Uh, and the answer to that is SMART has designed the multi-use path and recently received regulatory approval to construct it. SMART intends to build this path in late spring or summer as weather permits. So those are the questions that we received from the last meeting and the answers to them. And thanks, Bill. Uh, Jim, do you have anything to, uh, to add? Uh, not that you would, but if you do, now would uh, be this good time. The only thing I'd add, Mayor, is that um, I just want to also let you know that we have some of our partners and transit agencies in the room. So as the council comes up with questions or um, or in the course of the conversation with the community, uh, we have from the general manager of Golden Gate um, Bridge Highway Transportation District, Dennis Mulligan is here, general manager Nancy Whelan uh, from Marin Transit, and I see Bill Whitney is here from Transportation Authority of Marin. Uh, so those are, we've been working really closely with TAM and with Golden Gate uh, and Marin Transit on all of the work regarding the Larkspur Extension, the, trans the Interim Transit Center, the Permanent Transit Center, and so forth. Um, there's a couple other that I just want to point out in case uh, there are questions uh, outside of San Rafael. I, I see uh, Supervisor Damon Connolly is here. Um, City of Larkspur Councilmember Kevin Haroff and um, from Congressman Huffman's office, Jenny Calloway. So those are um, options if we've got questions that the council has to direct towards other entities and staff is available for anything you might have as well. I may have missed someone if they came in after. I don't think so because, us. frankly, I had a list prepared that I was going to, uh, to mention as well. Uh, only, only Damon could survive this comment, and that is I was going to wait a little bit for the introductions, knowing that Damon would be here eventually. Damon, good to see you. <laughs> Sorry about that, David. <laughs> Fortunately, we're good friends. Uh, and thanks uh, to uh, to the others. And I think Kevin is actually uh, 
the current mayor. In fact, I know he is. So thanks for joining us from Larkspur. So thanks for joining us, uh, everyone, to help us through this process. Uh, everyone mentioned and certainly including everyone here tonight has a vested interest. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, we'll break the uh, the, the um, city council comments, if you could, into two segments. One, you've heard uh, the presentation by Bill, and I think you have copies uh, of, of it, so you've probably read it in advance. So if there are any additional questions of Bill with regard to the questions that were asked and his response, uh, now would be a good time. If you wish to wait uh, for a few moments um, to uh, near the near the end uh, to conclude or comment, uh, general insight, uh, certainly will allow for that. My biggest concern is last meeting we had no, no chance for council members uh, to, uh, to make a, a statement or ask questions, so I want to make sure that we're uh, able to do so tonight. So if anyone has questions, now would be a good time, and not anyone, uh, council members first. And uh, I know you're hot to try, Richard, <laughs> but council members first and then uh, further public comment either on the questions that were asked and answered or anything else that's on your mind so uh, we will have time though I'm gonna I'm gonna stop everything at uh, uh, 815 so you'll have plenty of time for comment by council members so questions Pass this long. Sure. Okay. I'll start off uh, thank you for that you answered uh, some of the very top questions I have um, so the one that I know we've been talked about in general, but I'd like to have a more specific answer is uh, there's been a lot of plans that have been looked at for this area, station area plan, we have a bicycle pedestrian plan, and how how have they been looked at in terms of compatibility and like the intersection, I don't mean like physical road intersection, but the intersection of all those plans, like to me that would be something I would like to, to see or to talk about. Uh, you're right. There's a lot of planning happening in and around the uh, the station area. Uh, we do have the station area plan. Uh, the bicycle and pedestrian uh, uh, advisory committee is working on a new master plan update. They are well aware of what's happening in the transit area uh, and have continued to want to have a, a bicycle path that goes down Tamil Pius Avenue as opposed to where it's currently located today. Uh, that's something that is in the long range planning for the station area. Uh, there are other interests of um, restoring the uh, the waterway uh, and, and changing some of the areas there. Uh, all of those ideas are being incorporated into our planning for the station itself. Uh, but the the transit area, the uh, the transit study was focused on transit, frankly, and uh, and needs to be broadened in order to to bring some of these other aspects into it. It was a it was a very transit focused plan, as I think you saw in the, the presentation from the last meeting. Uh, the the you know the, the pluses and minuses, the trade offs that were associated with that were mostly transit focused, and I think there is a real opportunity in the planning for the permanent center to bring a much more uh, community broad based focus to the the transit area. And I think that's a good point because we're going to end up having trade offs. Like we can't have it all, and, and my concern is that in some of the plans there might be desires that are somehow competing and so just making sure that we recognize those and have a conversation about those both with the community and as a council if that Council if that occurs councilmember colin if i could just add on to that quickly uh, we have the powerpoint show here that we used at the last meeting we are uh, it's the same one that we used at the last meeting we we're planning on doing a long staff presentation tonight uh, but part of that PowerPoint show talked about the permanent transit center and the need to make sure that we are using all of these plans that you mentioned as guiding documents and that in the creation of a permanent transit center plan. And as we've been working with Golden Gate Transit, who would actually be doing the RFP to hire an environmental consultant on board to, to do the environmental and design work for the permanent transit center, we're referencing all of those plans that you mentioned in that document. So right from the very beginning, anyone who's interested in working on the environmental and design of the permanent transit center will know that those are our base documents that we're using. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> I was actually, I was hoping that we could have a, a representative from SMART here tonight too, but possibly you would be able to answer this question in terms of the multi-use path on the extension from second to Larkspur. We've been told that, you know, SMART is willing to construct that multi-use path um, as they're constructing the extension as long as we have environmental clearance and the funding in place. And as far as I know, there's no funding in place and we don't have the environmental clearance yet, um, but we're working to that. 
my question is if they start their construction as they've planned in in summer of this year and they start from Larkspur and work their way back to San Rafael the impact on us being able to put a multi-use path along parallel to the tracks um, and basically within the right-of-way realistically um, is the opportunity now or never because once that's in place once those tracks are in place the fence is in place how realistic and what does the cost do change you know if we're having if we haven't raised the three and a half million dollars estimated dollars to do it while they're constructing it what is that going to look like a year down the road or two years down the road is it, is, is it going to be fiscally in fe not feasible to do it if we don't do it now and that that leads to the question of do we have time to do it now and or is it not going to happen yeah it's a good question uh, uh we have received uh, 250,000 in design funding so that's significant and we've also received a million dollars although today it's in smart's budget not san rafael's budget but that is uh able to be transferred to san rafael from mtc so we actually have a portion of the construction funding in hand today uh that that could support the multi-use path uh, but your comment is well taken. We we kicked off the multi-use plan design. Uh, actually, uh, Paul Klassen from uh, Alta is here in the audience as well, uh, and he is working on the multi-use uh, environmental uh, process and the design effort that we're going to. We're hoping to get 30% uh, design drawings done in that in the next six to nine months. So we'd have the environmental document and the, and the design uh, put together we think in time to uh, catch up to SMART if, in fact, we can really get it done that quickly. There's some question about the environmental process and whether we can get environmental clearance. I think SMART has certainly expressed a concern about the environmental clearance process, but we believe there is a way to get that uh, accomplished on the, on the multi-use path. Um, I, the SMART uh, knows that we are intending to bring a multi-use path forward uh, they have in fact said that they will construct it if we bring it to them on time uh, their project starts construction in the summertime but is really in earnest for the next 18 months so if we can get something done in the next year get it to them i think they still have time to get it into their plans and to your point if we can't do that or we we miss that deadline it's going to be much more difficult to construct after smart is operating and I'll just add uh, um, on that point that we have had, uh, and I, as recent as yesterday, uh, had discussions with Farad on, on this point along with several others. And um, nothing is impossible, but if we don't have it uh, constructed at the same time, it's going to be, as you might well imagine, far more expensive and therefore less probable. So I think as a community, we should be very much behind the idea of a multi-use path. I know I am, and uh, we have an agreement with uh, SMART that we're working out now that specifies that that will, uh, that will occur. The one thing that I discussed with Farad was, and I think it's fair to say there are no real secrets, I guess, uh, SMART has been successful in obtaining a number of grants. Uh, I sit on the SMART board, so we've approved a number of uh, application of those grants to multi-use paths, uh, Santa Rosa, Petaluma, points north, let's say. So one of the things that uh, I th I'm hopeful um, that we will witness is uh, SMART's help and cooperation in applying for grants um, that might very well be successful. The problem is we don't have a lot of time to, to pull this thing off. Uh, so we're going to have to explore virtually every possibility. Uh, Bill mentioned we have a million dollars. We have 250000 for the environmental, but a million bucks that we can use for uh, the, the construction. And who knows exactly, uh, no one here does, but more than likely it's going to cost, one estimate, let's say, is th uh, $3 million bucks. So we need another two. But there's, there's quite a lot of interest in the community and, and other funding sources, so I'm optimistic at this point. If it wasn't for the time constraint, uh, I'd say for sure we're going to have it done. The, the constraint is, is pretty significant. But at the same time, it's something the community wants, I think, and therefore we're going to be pushing pretty hard to, uh, to see that that uh, happens at the logical time. It's the most efficient and economical time. So we're going to, as a community, miss the boat, and it won't be directed at any particular person, I hope. Uh, but it uh, will require the combined efforts of the whole community to make this thing happen. So anyway. 
so on this and, and this, Jim, I know, I know we've probably spoken about this before and, and maybe, I, again, I don't know if there's anybody in, in the audience that might be able to address it in the, in the text of the original measure Q and the expenditure plan, it, it's, it's stated that smart would fund multi-use path. Um, I, I'm just trying to understand is, is that a, just a best efforts piece that that's listed in that document or is there any liability to them because it was put forth in the election document um, and as an attachment to the measure Q for them to fund the multi-use path sure uh, I'll do my best to try to respond to this I think it's uh, a question that probably is best directed to smart but um, my understanding through working with smart employees is that uh, their take is that when when smart was proceeding and designing and figuring out what they could do with the with the funds that are available um, they looked at uh, kind of phase one and future phase multi-use paths and the their the, the paths that fell into their phase one category were ones that were I, in my words you know more simple to construct not as many environmental constraints um, so those are the ones that we're seeing happen right now uh, the future future path uh, projects had additional issues such as the one that we're talking about from second anderson where there's a waterway and there's there's other issues of right away um, and those were i think considered by smart to be kind of future phase as funding is available um, to create them so uh, i can't cite all of the different dates when the when the committees associated with smart um, but i understand that to be the 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 logic and that there's a commitment on the areas that are kind of future phase paths to work with jurisdictions to identify funding and to help put them in but it's not something that's part of smart's current budget One thing I'd like to add is, is I've seen some comments that, that says the city is going to have to pay for this. And I just want to let people know that we do not have funds in our budget to be able to pay for a multi-use path. So the city will not be paying for this. Um, it will be the city teaming up with SMART and, and other agencies or other organizations to seek outside funds through TAM or through MTC uh, and seek grants either at the state or federal level. Um, to fund the path. Uh, so as, as to whether the city could be reimbursed or the project could reimbur reimbursed, um, I think that's highly doubtful. I think that the way that I've seen these projects work is that there's momentum to work with different agencies and seek funding and get a project funded and then kind of moving on to the next project. I'm not familiar with maybe Bill Whitney from, from TAM or others can think of an example, but uh, I have not seen that happen, no. Yeah, um, I'm not sure to whom I'm addressing my question, but it might be our city attorney. So, Rob, if you've fallen asleep back there, you should wake up now. <laughs> I, I was, but I woke up right when you started talking. <laughs> Terrific. Well, um, not, not to reprise everything we discussed in the last meeting on January 19th, but I think in the course of staff's presentation then and the PowerPoint we learned as a community, or many people learned, some of us already knew, that um, the transit center as it currently exists uh, is not owned by the city of San Rafael and we therefore have no control over its disposition instead it's owned by the Golden Gate Bridge District who in or around 2005 entered into an MOU with SMART uh, both parties at the time anticipating that the SMART measure would come on the ballot and that the voters hopefully would approve SMART's construction and the intention of that MOU in part was to look ahead to that time when SMART were to build tracks through the transit center, thereby disrupting, give or take, half of the transit center and forcing buses out onto the street. The MOU makes explicit reference to the parties coming together at such time 
and figuring out a long-term or permanent solution in the event that happened. So my question is, and um, without betraying anything that may be the subject of confidential negotiations now, which none of us expects you to do, can you enlighten us on where SMART and the Golden Gate Bridge District, how their, um, what their positions are on this MOU and where they feel their respective responsibilities are in order to address a problem that I know many of the people who have come here tonight are really concerned about, which is once the extension happens and once the transit center is now spread out over our city streets in an interim fashion, what can we expect from this MOU and the commitment made back in 2005? I'll make two comments in response and then offer the city manager an opportunity to report on the discussions with those parties as to what they're doing about that agreement because he's been communicating with them more recently than me in that regard. The two comments I'll make are these. First, in our view, that agreement does appear, though only between SMART and the Bridge District, to be intended to benefit and protect the city of San Rafael. Uh, I, I believe that in reading the agreement that it was not made absent uh, any thought toward the city, rather concerns uh, about the impact on the city uh, appear from the body of the agreement. That's my read of it. Um, secondly, I would uh, say that while the city does not own that property, as you pointed out, council member, the city does have control over its streets and the use of its streets. And so that uh, factor has been part of what's uh, been discussed in the negotiation among uh, these parties, Smart, Bridge District, and the city. With regard to how those two parties are currently addressing their obligations under their 2005 agreement, Again, I'll invite uh, Jim to respond. Yes, uh, so the two parties, and I'll ask the general manager for Golden Gate Transit, Dennis Mulligan, if I, if I say anything that doesn't sound right, he can jump up to the podium and add to it. Uh, but the two parties, Golden Gate and SMART, are actively working together now to reach an agreement as, a, as a, the successor to the 2005 MOU. Um, the, the 2005 MOU says that there needs to be a funding plan in place for a permanent transit center. And I think both Golden Gate Transit and SMART uh, agree that that's the case. And they're working now to memorialize that and put that together in an in a, in agreement. Um, I'd heard a tentative time frame of April, it's, um, so I don't know if that's changed, but it's, it's imminent that they would reach that agreement. Dennis, do you wish to add? Thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. Dennis Mulligan, the general manager of Smart. Uh, excuse me, Golden Gate. On. <coughs> New no head, Dennis. Uh, is this on? Yes. Thank you for having me uh, tonight. Uh, with respect to your question, I want to offer one clarification first. The purpose of the 2005 MOU was to transfer 60 miles of railroad right away from the Bridge District and a couple other agencies that preserved it for future use to SMART at no cost. And then the transit center is one element of that. We provided a whole 60 mile uh, right away to them. With respect to the specific question, we are actively engaged in negotiations with SMART, uh, with legal counsel. Uh, we're in formal negotiations, and since we're in negotiations, it's premature to say what we're discussing, other than that our time frame is consistent with what you said. So our, our goal is to, you know, uh, have a, a draft agreement that we can take to our boards in the next couple months. Thanks, sir. I have two related questions. The first one's for our city attorney, and then I'll turn to uh, Director of Public Works. Um, Rob, I understand that our authority as the city of San Rafael is limited to our streets um, and that the primary areas of interest where we have some control are the, the, two, the crossings, um, the Anderson Drive crossing and what we all call the flip, moving the, um, the tracks. So is it fair to say that those are the only areas that we really have any authority that we will be exercising in the upcoming several weeks? The areas of property 
that we own and over which we have authority are correctly stated, council member. But I wouldn't like uh, the impression to be left that those are the only items of concern in the negotiations because they're clearly not. We are working with these other parties to address the issues uh, on property that we don't own, the transit center and points beyond. So for reasons similar to what uh, Mr. Mulligan just said, I am reluctant in this forum to comment further on what uh, uh, is um, transpiring with regard to those negotiations. It, it's not that it's a secret. It will be public when draft agreements are presented to the council and to other uh, public bodies for review. But right now, that's all I think appropriate for me to say in this context. So we can agree that we're using every ounce of influence that we have um, informally and and uh, personally and in any way we can find to influence those agreements. Certainly, that, that's what I was trying to get at earlier by, by uh, suggesting that there are different uh, points of leverage that we believe the city has and which it has been relying upon and discussing with these other two parties. So we're certainly doing our best. I'd say that Jim and I talk virtually daily about uh, these issues as our office supports the work that these two gentlemen are doing uh, on those negotiations. And we absolutely want to um, you know, support all of those efforts and keep them going and encourage them as um, much as we can. We want every, every lever, every bit of our Im informal influence to be exercised as much as possible. But turning to our formal... Mary, Mary yeah. Beth, before you go on, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, I believe we um, th that SMART has the right of way across Anderson Drive, and that's why we're in the predicament we are with Anderson Drive, where they can potentially close that street if, in fact, we don't get approval for the Anderson Drive crossing from the CPUC. So I just want to make sure that I understand Rob's response. That's correct, and I may have misapprehended the council member's description of the areas to which she was referring, but that's true. I mean, that was the deal that was struck 20 years ago when Anderson Drive was allowed to be constructed by the PUC that if uh, the train ever came that there would need to be uh, a way to cross that the PUC would uh, authorize and if not that the street uh, would not be able to remain open. That's why we're working now as you well know to try to get that PUC approval. I know only too well the detailed history of how this all came to be. But now turning to the, the, the real the question for um, Public Works, these agreements that we will be signing um, relating to these what, crossings, the, the FLIP and Anderson Drive, um, will um, entail a great deal of street construction in um, a fairly busy business district. Could you walk us through just in sort of the briefest um, description of what that construction schedule is going to look like? I know there are road closures contemplated and all sorts of things. If you could just give us a brief rundown of that. Yeah, we, we, we've, uh, and just to be clear again, uh, we also control the city streets in and around the transit center as, a, as an additional point to be made. Um, the, uh, the, the construction schedule per se from, has not been established by SMART. Their, their general intention is to begin construction in Larkspur and work their way north. Uh, that's obviously not some very linear process. They'll be doing work in different places, but generally speaking, their intention is to work north from Larkspur to San Rafael. Uh, there will be road closures. We're anticipating that, that both uh, Francisco Boulevard West and Anderson Drive will be closed uh, for extended periods of time. Uh, the agreements that we are uh, discussing with SMART would uh, require that they not close both of those streets at the same time, and they would min minimize the disruption to those streets. But it's anticipated that they could be closed for four to six months uh, at, at, at some point during the construction process. So it's a significant impact uh, for for traffic in San Rafael during the construction period. Uh, West Francisco obviously uh, is a very uh, significant uh, chunk of San Rafael that's going to be under construction because the, the tracks are flipping to where uh, West Francisco Boulevard is today and West Francisco Boulevard is flipping to where the train tracks are today. So that's a very significant construction project. Uh, it entails some uh, bridge work where the train actually crosses Mahone Creek, uh, and then the work that continues from there. There's utility work, there's uh, road construction, rail construction, 
a whole series of activities associated with that part of the construction project. So that's the biggest impact on the city. And, and, and could you just give us your best guess? I understand it's a guess, so we're not going to hold you to it, but roughly what quarter, no hold me to what quarter <laughs> would you expect this construction to be occurring? Uh, just your, your, your best guess at this my, point. My best guess is that's a big part of the project, and it will be starting probably late in 2017. Late this year, we expect one. I, or, or I think Francisco Boulevard is the most significant construction project. Uh, and certainly utilities are going to have to come up. They're in the streets now, and I think that will, will start fairly soon. And Vice Mayor Bushy, if I could just add to that, um, there's probably some in our audience that didn't attend our first study session where we went through all of these projects in a great amount of detail. So I just want to describe really quickly, there's kind of two different options um, that SMART has considered to go from uh, downtown San Rafael to Larkspur. One of them is within their current right-of-way, uh, which as it leaves the downtown area and goes towards West Francisco is closer to the businesses than the freeway. The, the tracks, as you know, are on the business side um, and rather than the freeway side. Um, so that's their right of way. And, um, and then it goes through Anderson Drive and heads towards Larkspur. Uh, I think the city's preference has been, as, as we've been working with them and, and describing this to the council, to flip the tracks with the road at West Francisco Boulevard, which puts the tracks up against the freeway and eliminates two at-grade crossings on West Francisco Boulevard in front of the businesses. Uh, we think that that is better for business. We also think that it's much safer for vehicles and for pedestrians, cyclists, anyone using that area to eliminate the two at-grade crossings altogether is fantastic. We want to really minimize at-grade crossings as much as we possibly can. So although it is going to be some shorter-term disruption and nobody's going to like that um, to have projects going on on West Francisco and Anderson Drive, the intent of both of those projects is so that they are much more successful in the long run and make it safer for all parties in the long run. What, what John was trying to say, but this uh, graphic behind us depicts, uh, you know, the, the sort of before where there are two at-grade crossings. Uh, the green is Francisco Boulevard. The red is the train tracks in the current configuration. And then when the flip happens, the train tracks move to the east of the road, uh, that being the red again. Uh, the green is the new Francisco Boulevard alignment, and the yellow is the multi-use path. Thank you for your very thorough and colorful. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many hours I spent on this, so I, I'm, I'm kind of exhausted with regard to questions, but I do have one and then perhaps a comment to, uh, to frame uh, the balance of the evening. So my comment is, and something I know that you've been working on, we reviewed briefly uh, this morning, um, and that is some sense of second and third we know there are 60,000 cars per day that go back and forth on second and third considerable amount of traffic and there's quite a lot of community concern with regard to the train now proceeding through to Larkspur disrupting that flow of traffic to some degree um, and so therefore my question was now there are stoplights so at various frequencies traffic is stopping going east and west uh, this would be a further extension of that stop stop period. So can you give us some sense of how much of a disruption that's that's going to be, a time sense or whatever way you might be able to help us better visualize what the consequence is? Yeah, there, there are uh, approximately 60,000 cars moving back and forth east, east and west. And if you throw in Heatherton Drive, there's another 20 or you know so thousand cars as well. So you get up to 80 or 90,000 cars moving through that area on a given day. Um, the, the impact as we see it, uh, the, the smart, the, the train actually sends a signal to the control center in smart headquarters that uh, starts a sequence of operations, which is the, the, the signals uh, clear the intersection. So it, it, there's a 15 second lag so that, that pedestrians, for instance, crossing the street can get across the street before the light changes. Uh, the, the lights start flashing, uh, the signal arms come down. The train crosses the intersection, the signal arms go back up, the lights start stop flashing, and then traffic, in theory, returns to normal. 
the, the sequence of events associated with that is that um, it, you could, uh, crossing east and west, uh, miss a complete green light. So in other words, if you, if you approach the intersection and it turns red, you might wait there for, for what would have been the normal red, the normal green, and another red before the light gets back to its sequence again. So uh, we're thinking it's a matter of a minute and a half to two minutes based on the timing of the signals in San Rafael. The actual the sequence of the train crossing is more like 45 to 50 seconds. Uh, but depending on sort of the timing of all that, it could be a full signal cycle that, that gets missed in the process. No, I think that's I think that's helpful. And just coincidentally, I was out at McGinnis Park, and it was a train that was coming through. Now it was going pretty quickly because you probably know where we, being smart now, uh, are testing at at speed. So this went through more quickly than I was accustomed to. But it took 35 seconds because I just happened to be there at the right time. The bars came down, train bars up, and it was at 35 seconds. Now that's at speed, so it's uh, it's more than that. Uh, but a minute, minute and a half. Or, a minute and a half, two minutes, I think you said. Again, depending uh, on where the, the train yeah, the train controls the signal. Sure. It's not the other way around. It's not yeah. that the, the train goes on the green light. Unfortunately, that would be uh, very helpful if it did that. Right. Uh, but in fact, the train does control the signal, so the, the signal gets preempted for the train moving forward. So it could be up to a minute and a half or, or more for the whole sequence. Happen. If you're impatient like I am, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we have a follow-up on that. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, along those lines, Rob I, again, right? <laughs> this is for DPW. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that over the last couple of years, the city has invested significant funds in uh, redoing its intersections, intersection signals around SMART in order to plan for exactly what you've described and also to ensure um, adequate safety. Uh, but the point is to develop a more efficient system so that our lights connect uh, better with SMART's um, uh, control system so that we smooth the flow of traffic as much as possible. And we also have a cue cutter in place in order to keep cars from backing up in intersections. All that said, I, I've been told, and either it was you, Bill, who said it and I heard it third hand or someone else told me and I shouldn't attribute it to you, that when we put the signals in, uh, up until fairly recently, we didn't realize that there was a calibration error, and in fact, the signals weren't acting, the new signals weren't being uh, as efficient as they could be. That's been addressed, and we're seeing traffic flow more smoothly east and west across Heatherton. Is that right, or am I uh, you misinformed? Are, you are correct, and I think it might have been me that told you that. Okay. Uh, there was a problem uh, on the 3rd and Irwin uh, intersection where the timing was off after the complete installation was made. Uh, that signal was mistimed, so it was not uh, acting as it should in in uh, conjunction with the third and Heatherton signal, which is moving traffic, you know, obviously through Third uh, Street, through Heatherton Street, and onto the freeway on Heatherton. Uh, I don't know anybody who is from the uh, the uh, San Pedro Road area. I know uh, two people that are, uh, and and I am from that area as well. Uh, traffic is noticeably better, at least in the morning when I go through it now than it was even a couple weeks ago because the signal timing has been fixed and that has uh, improved the traffic through that area. Uh, I need to uh, recognize Dan Helmer, who is the council member of uh, Larkspur. There are many notable folks in the, in the audience tonight, but you know how public officials are. They always like to hear their names. So, Dan, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I was going to make a further comment, but I think I'll wait until uh, public... You folks have had a chance to provide your input, either specifically with regard to the uh, questions and answers that you heard or anything else that might be on your mind. And like I said, I'd like to conclude this section uh, at about 8.15 so council members have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to share with you some of their thoughts um, at this point in time. So who would like to start? I suspect Richard would. Oh, you don't have to. You were, you were racing a moment ago, so you're welcome to if you wish. Hi, anyone Richard. else? I'm sorry, Richard. Yeah, anyone else that would like to speak, if you could maybe line up, queue up, and if you could keep your comments, because last time we had quite a number, which is great, but some went on and it uh, short-circuited other comments. So if you could keep your comments to uh, two minutes, and, um, and our city clerk will help us keep track of the time. And if you have this burning desire to go on and you have points that haven't been already mentioned, please do. Richard, good evening. Thank you. 
and thank you for arranging this meeting. I know I was one of many that asked for you to listen and engage on this topic. Thank you for setting this up and scheduling it. Um, as I listen to these comments and the impacts, uh, I'm reminded of a movie. Uh, here we are with a train that is going to carry what's projected to be... Thank you. As, as I listen to the comments and the insight from the professionals here, I, I'm reminded of a movie. Uh, the movie is The Hunger Games. Here we are talking about a train that itself projects will carry 231 riders. That's actually one way, so that's 116 people per day. Those privileged 116 people I, I'm hearing going to delay 80,000 people now. I, I didn't know it was quite such a high number. My number was lower. I'm impressed the city's actually made it up to 80,000. So 80,000 people are going to be inconvenienced on the roads alone, 9,000 transit center users for the sake of 231 ride, rides or 116 riders. This is just like the Hunger Games, a privileged through few sailing through, inconveniencing the masses. This is not the way it should be. I had some quick questions. If the city does not improve, sorry, it does not approve transit center operations to move to the interim locations, what would happen? Obviously, I realize you won't respond now, but if you could come back in the next meeting or in, in minutes. Um, when will a complete traffic study be completed that includes the 101 backup situation, levels of service impact on traffic? How much will that cost and who will be paying for it? The sequence really should have been, we had a full EIR, and that should have been done by SMART. This was anticipatable, and we should still have that. We need to affirm SMART starts operations. We need to know it actually generates significant ridership, and 231 riders by the year 2035, I would not call that significant in order to justify uh, this significant impact. The transit center needs to be fully funded, ideally built, and then only then should SMART extend to Larkspur. This should be the logical sequence. Why can we not still adhere to this logical sequence that should have been known in, back in 2005? I'd like to understand what level of service impacts there will be to second and third street when there are the second and third street crossings and the interim buses parked on city streets. If Anderson Drive were to be closed temporarily or permanently, what would the traffic level of service impact be on the surrounding area and on businesses, which I realize may not be an EIR question, which is significant. What crossing does the city have planned at Anderson and does this crossing meet SMART's needs and expectations? Is that my time's up? Okay. You hear me? Is that good? You can hear me okay? Oh, okay. So uh, I hear the, the legal argument here that it's in, in negotiation and it's a matter of time before there's an agreement. I'm not looking for an agreement, okay? I'm, I'm looking for the city to provide as many obstacles as possible to delay this. Uh, we have evidence here as to how much the congestion is going to increase. We have a sequencing in both directions. There's no way we can fix sequencing eastbound traffic. Um, they have to be able to predict when the train's crossing 2nd Street way back in Miracle Mile. So we have no sequencing left anymore for 1 minute 50 every 15, 2 minutes every 15 minutes when a train crosses. We have two cards on our side, and one is this flip, which we have to approve and, and we have to provide street access for, and we have the Anderson Crossing. And I see a way of not just talking about it with an eventual agreement, but actually putting our heels down here and, and getting bloody-minded about it, because it's this is going to be hell for us. 
you have a whole bunch of people here and a whole bunch of people who do not know. And a year from now, they'll be knocking on all your doors. You, you, you can guarantee that's going to happen. We need to, I'd like to hear, hear, this is a workshop, right? So can we, can we get more information as to what we can, what we can do about this, please, legally? Can, can I ask you to, to answer that with more detail? Sorry about this. The rules of the road are you're, you're, uh, we're quite interested in your comments and please address them to but us. But it's a workshop. And this is not will, a regular meeting. Well, no, we people. will, we, excuse, excuse me, we will establish the rules of the uh, workshop so that it's fair and everybody can participate. The rules are that you express your views as we did last time and and uh, as as appropriate, we'll respond. Well, that's like a regular meeting. This is a workshop. We should oh, no, be able to no, have these, I these, could be going on with some factual error or that someone should be stopping you're, me. You're wasting what might be time better spent well this is this is my point here I, th I think we should get bloody minded about this put our heels down we have two cars on our side here it's the Anderson crossing that we're forced to pay for right we have to pay for that sir and so we don't we refuse to pay for it and we refuse to co co cooperate with the flip if you could uh, okay. conclude your remarks thank you Good evening, David Schoenbrunn. I'm concerned by the level of hysteria that are being, that's been being generated here by Richard Hall and others, that um, it's based on uh, bad information. Uh, we heard tonight about the uh, uh, worst scenario traffic uh, problem that was put into the model. If that occurred, that would represent a complete failure of your signal interconnect. The whole point of an ad adaptive signal interconnect is to phase your existing traffic lights so that they come up red at the time the train is going to pass through. If it doesn't do that, you didn't get what you paid for. And so that is not what's to be expected. SMART did a study, uh, an EIR, of this traffic. My recollection of it was that there were no impacts to downtown of this, of this travel. And, and the re Please, we, we and need the to respect reality Leonard. is if a train goes through a red signal, there's, it, it makes no, it, it has no effect because the signal is, is already read. So I'm concerned that there's bad information coming from the city that is unnecessarily agitating your residents. It's not a good thing. Um, two more points. Um, uh, DPW talked about closing West Francisco. You're building a new road. Uh, there's no reason to close the road if you're building a new one alongside the existing one. When that road is finished, you open it, and then the tracks are built where the old road was. So I don't see where there's a big disruption there. Um, that seems to be um, failed thought. Finally, as regards the uh, multi-use path, um, I think the time constraint that has been talked about tonight is overblown. Uh, you already have one million dollars in funding for construction. If that were targeted, that should be able to preserve the right of way and make it possible to come in whenever the additional funding is available um, to finish up the job. But but with a million dollars, you should be able to do a lot so that you have at least um, a land cleared. Um, oh, and uh, protected by fence from uh, existing rail traffic, and not a big deal. So long story short, I see a whole lot of, oh my God, stuff happening here that is inappropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. You know, uh, we, uh, we have a great community, and one of the things I particularly like about it is uh, we can work together, we can listen to one another, uh, cordially, I would suggest, and respectfully. There may be different viewpoints, but I think that it's important for us to take into account each and every one. I intend to, I council intends to, and I expect you to. So if you would proceed, please. Grace.
to get on a platform. Um, Grace Hughes, um, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm glad to meet you all. Uh, I'm the president retired and chair of the board of Marin Air Porter. And uh, I only say that as to sort of give my bona fides of some transportation experience. Uh, I won't go so far as to say expertise, but I will say experience for the last 35 years. I come tonight um, essentially to applaud the mayor for uh, having the courage, audacity, and foresight to go to the smart board and ask for a delay. And I would sort of amplify that and ask for a uh, complete uh, erasure of taking the train to Larkspur. And I, I, and, and but a, but asking that as a city council supporting that um, that measure uh, because of the extreme, as we've heard, impact that taking the train to Larkspur might have, and in floating that idea both to Congressman Huffman and to others, the two concerns that came up were. The reason that we couldn't possibly think of doing that is that the voters have been promised a direct link from Sonoma to the Larkspur Ferry. And SMART would lose the appropriations that they work so hard to acquire uh, if they don't use them in a timely manner. To the first concern, I would posit that there is a more efficient, cost-effective, and convenient solution to the question of voter satisfaction. Providing bus shuttle service to Larkspur would not only fulfill the promise to voters for seamless transit to the ferry terminal, it would also afford passengers direct access to the terminal without the quarter mile walk from the train terminus and would save literally, literally millions of dollars in construction costs. In addition, the time expenditure of using a direct shuttle from the San Rafael station to the ferry will take less time than riding the train, disembarking, and then walking to the ferry. In addition, the walk will not be amenable to those with disabilities, older riders, travelers with luggage, those wearing inappropriate footwear, high heels, or those traveling with small children. By acknowledging and acting upon Grace, the foregoing... Grace, if you could wrap it up, please. Okay, okay. You. If you were to acknowledge and act upon the foregoing, you would not need a new transit center the millions of dollars saved by not building a new center, the further disruption of San Rafael and Highway 101 traffic, and accessibility to San Rafael business and services would seem like a win for all. Thank you, Grace. Okay. We have, uh, we have 13 and perhaps more, but certainly 13 standing that wish to address us. And, uh, Frank, frankly, we're running uh, short of time. So if you could keep your comments to the two minutes, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you council members. And, uh, thank you, Mayor, um, for uh, calling for a, a delay in the process. I'm a licensed contractor. I've been uh, licensed in the state for 33 years. I consult with the Contractors Licensing Board and I frequently shop along the Anderson Corridor at places like Shamrock, uh, Ceramic Tile Design, Tom Duffy, uh, uh, there's another, Golden State Lumber. Uh, the delays that the construction along Anderson is going to cause are tremendous on these businesses. Already, there's significant traffic delays from uh, construction workers like myself traveling uh, through that corridor. Uh, you have to look at the significant business impacts you're going to be imposing on some of these businesses that I just mentioned. Uh, in addition, uh, one of my most frequent stops is at Ceramic Tile Design. Uh, they provide an education service as well as supplying materials there. They train contractors on new materials and new uh, substances, and we talk about this at the Contractors Licensing Board. Uh, when you create uh, a delay through six months was astonishing to hear that, and uh, you're going to be impacting uh, 
not only what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to echo what Richard Hall stated, that uh, there seems to be a problem, a simple cost-benefit analysis here that seems to be just floating into space and not really having any impact. But serving, what, 230-some people for impacting tens of thousands? I mean, you really have to give that some serious thought. So thank you. Good evening. My name is Patrick Seidler from Transportation Alternatives for Marin. Promote sustainable mobility, including bicycles, walking, and even trains. I um, want to thank the council very much and the staff for all the uh, opportunities to participate in this process and uh, let all of us come out, come out and talk and uh, identify our concerns and priorities. What I'd like to point out to you, if you look in the first tab of the document I just showed you, it shows the reason for why, why we're in such a hustle here. It says right there, it's the, the executive director and the chairman of SMART are both saying, because the people, they voted to tax themselves to bring the train down to Larkspur. Okay, well, that's only half the story, right? That's only half of it. If you look at tab number two, you actually get a look at measure R from 2006 which failed at the box office, which failed at the, bo the box office. <laughs> I'll start again. It failed at the ballot box. And that, that measure had $46 million for a pathway for part of the way between Larkspur and Cloverdale and did not receive the two-thirds majority. The only difference between 2006 Measure R and 2008 Measure Q is $91 million allocated for measure for the bicycle pedestrian pathway, and it goes the entire length of the route from Larkspur to, uh, to, Lark Larkspur to, to Cloverdale. Then you turn back into the main letter there, and I've outlined for you how much is SMART spent on that pathway so far of Measure Q. Zero dollars in Marin County. Zero dollars to build the pathway. And in fact, they only plan on building 2.5 miles of the pathway with Measure Q dollars. And so what we're here to ask you is, when you give them the permission to use the property in San Rafael, that you ask, it, that you ask SMART to fund $2 million of that pathway. You might say, wait a second, there's not enough money there. SMART doesn't have that money. I say that that's an incorrect assertion. In fact, also in this document, you'll see the 2005 memorandum with the Golden Gate Bridge District. And what it says is, is that that right-of-way is restricted to uh, transportation purposes only. SMART just extracted $850,000 from Regional Measure 2 for leases to junkyards and a cement property down in Southern Marin, down in Marin County and uh, Corte Madera. They have $850,000. It's found money that you guys could be asking for to put into that path. And the mayor's right. The more we get, the more money we get, the million dollars, 850000 if SMART kicks in a million instead of two, we draw more money to the multi-use project. We request five things on the last page that we suggest are solution-oriented uh, directions. One is, is that we get SMART to pay for the path to add to, to have them contribute to the pathway. We also suggest that they don't start building the pathway till the spring of next year. That gives us time to get the engineering done, get the environmental clearances done, and I think you're going to hear it tonight that there are some problems with the environmental clearances that they have. The other thing that we suggest in that list is don't come across Second Street with the SMART project until 2021, because that will give you time to build the, um, the transit center. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we're getting into a time crunch. I hate to say it, but we've got quite a few, and we want to hear from each and every one. Uh, so what we will do is we'll run uh, public, because uh, we are interested, and in, I see a number of people that I highly regard and, and uh, know most of you. So we'll run it until 8.30, and then we're going to have to stop at wherever it may be. This is two Thank minutes you. if I talk two fast. Two minutes, yes, if you talk fast. Cindy Winter, Two minutes Larkspur. if you talk fast. 
SMART has an EIR problem when the area of Rice West Francisco Boulevard was environmentally cleared in the December 2014 environmental assessment. It had a specific configuration. Since that time, it has taken on a radically different configuration. Compare the drawings dated 2013 in Appendix G of the December 2014 EA with the drawings dated last August, kindly provided to me by the San Rafael DPW. West Francisco has been changed from two lanes to four. The area of construction impact is much enlarged. The first step to ask is whether the 2014 EA is adequate for the changed product project. Did the original analysis include this contingency? Based on the drawings, it most certainly did not. This area therefore needs some level of a CEQA NEPA review before the planned project can proceed. To determine the extent of review, one must ask, what are the changes to the project? What level of review is required? And what is the process to achieve that level? Any revised clearance must cover any aspects of the new design that are outside of what was previously cleared. Before a contract is properly put out to bid, it is essential to have completed all of the clearances. Even when design build, the contractor must stay within the boundaries of the 2014 EA unless it is updated. Now that the city is aware of the NEPA defect, the city should take care not to act in any way that could be construed as endorsing it. A contractor blindsided by a known but undisclosed defect in the plans and facing unexpected costs and delays may well lash out in litigation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Nessel. I live in Marinwood, upstream from all this, so I'm going to be dealing with whatever decisions that you make. I first want to say uh, it's a pleasure speaking before you. Uh, you really are my favorite of all city councils in uh, Marin. And it's Stephen, been, you got. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's been that way since the TAM meeting, because the TAM tax meeting, because you were looking out for the, the uh, uh, the interest of the community and I know uh, some people are saying higher office for many of you uh, and I think we have uh, uh, maybe a, I don't know if any of you want to run for president but uh, okay you're starting with um, your time but the reason I, I I'm here tonight first of all I want to echo I I'm there are a lot of good comments uh, Richard made some good comments John Perales uh, and, and Grace uh, all made good comments and I do endorse those and other people whose names I don't know, uh, with exception of one speaker tonight. Um, but um, what I what I wanted to talk about is not about. I wanted to talk about two things. First of all, federal funding in our new national administration is up for question, and it really there may be some rough weather ahead. And I think that needs to uh, figure in to any uh, commitment. Um, so, and that's obvious. Um, that's number one. But number two, what I want to talk, what I think is even more important is the location of the bus center that serves 9,000 people. I mean, you want to keep these two activities as close as possible together. Um, that is going to provide the most utility for uh, the transit rider. Um, now, there's been uh, discussion, I know, in the past, I don't know how serious it is, but to bring the ferry down to uh, San Quentin. So if we build this uh, link to somewhat near uh, Larkspur, are, is it, is it going to serve the purpose long term? So I think there's a lot of reasons to, to wait this decision out, um, see what the ridership is, see what the funding looks like, and um, we'll, we can make a better dis assessment later on in the process. And uh, I thank trust you. you to make good decisions. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you, John. Hi, I'm Kate Powers. I'm a member of um, San Rafael's uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And um, in August of 2016, the BPAC um, 
voted to make two recommendations. The mission of the BPAC is stated under its charter adopted by the City Council on January 20th of 2015. And one of the first goals is to serve as advisors to City Council for bicycle and pedestrian matters in the city, representing interests of citizens and local advocacy groups. The BPAC in its capacity as an advisory committee to the City of San Rafael voted unanimous, unanimously at its BPAC meeting on August 3rd to make the following two recommendations to Council. First was that BPAC supported the development of the multi-use path from Second to Rice along the smart right-of-way uh, to 30% engineering and through environmental clearance. Um, and there were two alternatives that we supported. But most importantly tonight, BPAC recommended that the City of San Rafael encourage SMART to fully fund the multi-use path in San Rafael as approved by the voters. Secondly, I'm also um, president of Marine Conservation League and recently Marine Conservation League wrote a letter to, um, hopefully I can find it, um, to the Golden Gate uh, Bridge Highway and Transportation District asking that uh, the district um, through its negotiations with the MOU that was created in 2000 and 2005 ask SMART and we're asking both the City of San Rafael and um, the Golden Gate um, Highway and Transportation District to ask SMART to apply for an extension to the funding timeline for completion of the San Rafael to Larkspur segment from the Federal Rail Administration and to modify the schedule for construction of that segment to allow time for rational and necessary planning to occur before it proceeds with the project. Marine Conservation League joins others in wanting SMART to be a successful transit link through, Mar through Marin County. But the impacts to San Rafael from SMART operations are of considerable concern and should be addressed before construction proceeds. There are not only, it's not only the resulting traffic congestion, but also the subsequent environmental and public ha safety hazards that impact San Rafael residents and those who frequent the businesses and medical offices in downtown and those who travel the area as a hub of major north-south and east-west transportation connection. Um, Implementation of the Larkspur segment requires more time for full-scale regional transportation planning in the area for the CPUC to fully pro process San Rafael's application for the at-grade crossing at Anderson Drive, for the funding for a permanent relocation of the transit center to be secured, and for the multi-use path from, from second down to Anderson to be in, um, catch up. And finally, I'm also on the Citizens Oversight Committee of TAM. And there, uh, f transportation funds, there's, there's a limit. And every time we go to MTC or TAM to pay for a project that SMART was, um, should have paid for because of Measure Q passing, those are less funds that are available for repairs of roads and other projects that our transportation funds need to pay for. Thank you. Hi, uh, council members and mayor. I'm Janet Shirley. I'm from Raphael Meadows. And first of all, I would very much like to echo the concerns of the last speaker and Richard Hall and others who are asking for you to please delay the Larkspur extension for all the reasons that have already been stated. Please, whatever you can in your possibility. Uh, the thing I would like to talk about also is the quiet zone. Um, this letter was just sent by the city engineer of Petaluma to one of my friends today, and it says, the work order to purchase and install the no train horn signs is complete, and the PWU operations is making this a priority, to have everything ready for the date that the QZ quiet zone becomes effective, which is April 19th for Petaluma. I'm asking you, and then it goes on to say, I have contacted the FRA, the CPUC, and SMART to notify each agency that the QZ establishment date, of the QZ establishment date, and that letter is on its way. I'm asking you, I have a very long list of subscribers. When are we going to get the quiet zone? People are really fed up. Uh, those of us that live near the tracks, around the tracks, 
um, that we know, we understand that there had to be a lot of train horn testing, but if Petaluma is getting a QZ in that early, we don't deserve anything less than that. There's no reason to hold up the QZ implementation. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tracy Tandy. I'm going to take less than two minutes. I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. I think we should protect the dollars of this community. I have a great concern that if we continue this project the way it's going and at this pace, that we will commit tax dollars and SMART will at, run out of money and come to us for more. So what I'm requesting is a delay of the Larkspur extension until there is proof of ridership. I think, I mean, that's, if they prove that there are people willing to go that slow at that price, pay the extra dollars for parking, and there are that many willing to do it when there can only be three train cars because the design was blown, I think that then we have a discussion that's reasonable. But proof of ridership should come first. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Bill O'Connell. I'm a longtime resident of San Rafael, and my law office is about a block away from the Mission uh, Crossing of SMART, so I've seen some of the impacts already. Um, the only thing I want to comment on tonight is the relocation of the Bettini Transit Center. Um, as, as everybody knows, that's basically two phases. There's a permanent relocation and an interim relocation. Each one is a significant size project. I think the permanent relocation is budgeted around $25 million. The interim relocation may even, in many ways, be more disruptive than whatever the permanent plan is. And there are many questions as to whether the interim uh, relocation will uh, somehow morph into becoming the permanent relocation of the transit center. Um, and and the I, I won't go into the details, actually, because Andrew pretty concisely and vividly uh, described some of the impacts of the interim relocation uh, with the elimination of one of the uh, bus uh, lanes, uh, relocation of traffic all over, and thus environmental impacts. Um, and the, the plan uh, worked out between Golden Gate Transit um, and SMART is that they are underway with a design build for the interim, um, and they are underway also with working on the plans for a permanent and working on an EIR or other environmental evaluation of the permanent relocation. That's a problem. Because as far as I'm concerned, from what I've seen, and I'm not the biggest expert around, maybe somebody can prove me wrong, but the interim relocation in and of itself is a project, as defined in CEQA, compelling an EIR if there are significant environmental impacts. I think that's basically the language of the statute. My question is, how can that project, the interim relocation, proceed without an EIR first? And even if I'm wrong, the result is the same. Because if I'm wrong, and, and it's really one project, and it's essentially two different phases, the interim phase and then the permanent phase, the result is the same. Because you do the EIR before you start the project. If, if the plan is, if the contention is that it's all one project, um, but they're starting it now, but going to do the EIR at a later point relative to phase two, as it were, the permanent relocation of the transit center, that doesn't work. You don't start your project and then do your EIR later. So unless, <laughs> unless, unless somebody proves me wrong, I, I hate to overstate the point, but I think it's unlawful to start the interim Bettini Center transit relocation without the EIR process before that work commences. Thank you. So here's the deal. <laughs> we have two minutes. Time for one speaker, and we have two, four, six, seven. Let them speak. Let them speak. Say again. Let them speak. Yeah, no, I know. Here's... 
start the bus now. No, no, wait a minute, sir. You're, you're not next in line. Uh, 30 seconds, <laughs> Because we're going to be here much longer. If let me let me let me ask. Everybody has unique ideas, I know, but we've had a lot of a lot of uh, input from the previous meeting and now this evening, and so let me ask those that are standing in line. We want to recognize uh, your thoughts, uh, but if you've already heard your point, uh, maybe it doesn't have to be repeated. Is that possible? Maybe call a couple people out, if you will, uh, it would be appreciated. Uh, we're not going to go beyond 9 o'clock, and if you want to hear what we have to say about the matter, then we have to uh, cut this off at some point in time. Why 9 o'clock? Because that's a reasonable hour. And we get later than that, I, what I find is uh, attention spans seem to drift, and valid comments also don't uh, gel quite as perhaps they should. So we can have one more speaker. If there's somebody has a burning, burning issue, then let's say again. I'm sorry. I'll take 30 seconds of the two minutes. 30 seconds. I'll take 30 also. I hear 30. I hear 30. <laughs> Do I hear 15? <laughs> Do I hear 15? Go right ahead. If if uh, there, uh, please don't add to the line because we'll, we're just not going to get this done. I will try to do this in 30. Uh, Greg Andrew from San Rafael Meadows. As I've watched this, I've come to the conclusion that the message and actions by SMART are this message. Here comes the train. All of the transportation methods get out of the way and give us all the money. Marine Air Porter, gone. Bettini Center getting kicked out. Impacts to downtown San Rafael traffic. A multimodal path that's not being built. And so there you go. And then a tax measure that was proposed that I believe was all about SMART and not about any other methods. So I'm asking the city to stand up and say, or somebody in authority stand up and say, this has got to stop and rethink this. And Thank we'll you talk very about much. that. Good evening. I'm Ross Elkins from the Sun Valley area. I've lived here since about 1966. Um, I agree with just about everything that's been said that's negative about the train. I call it the dumb train, not the smart train. Speak into it. Uh, so um, I just want to say that since this train project started, it has really lowered the quality of life of those of us who live here. I've been uh, commuting on a motorcycle for over 50 years, so I'm a little better off than most people stuck in cars. And the lags, and I'm retired, so I don't have to commute anymore. The lags that I run into often enough coming across these train tracks and these extra lights, it is now the ugliest looking intersection that I have ever seen in a small town anywhere it's with those three ugly lights, cars backed up. Yesterday I was driving west when on the other side the eastbound car still had a red light. There was no train around anywhere. When I jog around Phoenix Lake, when my knees can handle it, I have to hear the train horn in the deepest canyons around the lakes there. And this is just terrible. And thank so, you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, first point is that normal trains don't stop because they can't stop. This is a lightweight train. It could stop for all of our regular lights and, and, and obey our city lights without, without having to bow to smart because that train can stop and start. I agree with Grace that we should run buses, but we should run them starting now. And then the people will get used to that and they may say, hey, this is faster than riding the train on and it's cheaper. So it would, and it would also establish ridership, which supposedly they want to do. And third, if we can't get any movement, we may have to start a class action lawsuit. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Cynthia Murray. I'm with North Bay Leadership Council. We represent 25,000 employees in Marin, Sonoma, and Napa counties, and we urge you to please not delay the extension. This is a very, very important thing to employers. We are having a great deal of trouble filling jobs. We are needing to bring people in, and they don't want to be caught in the traffic. They're looking for the train, especially some of the very bright people who will be coming from San Francisco. So it's not 
just going to be people coming from the north. We're trying to bring up those young millennials who uh, want to stay in San Francisco, but we need them to fill the jobs up here, especially in San Rafael. So we urge you to do this. This is a connectivity to give us an actual transportation system, which we've been lacking. We haven't had the connectivity. It's a green transportation solution. The $48 million are extraordinarily wonderful for us to get. We know how hard it is to get the money. We urge you to please not delay this. And I want to say I know you're a solution-oriented council. I've been very, very proud to see how you solve problems. This isn't an either-or situation. This is an and situation. And I know you're going to be able to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Good evening, Maika Llorens Gulari um, um, with the school board for San Rafael City School. So thank you so much for having this special study session because I know you don't have to do it, and this is really nice. And also for the partnerships with the schools, like Safe Routes to Schools and all the improvements that we are doing uh, that you are helping us is great. I'm still extremely sa uh, worried about the safety of our kids uh, around the bus station. There is still not a way to go from the bus station to the Staples area. Uh, kids from Davidson, kids from San Rafael High School, uh, we are talking about uh, over 2,400 kids that they don't have a safe way to move around. And I invite you actually to walk with me because I'm also a resident of Bret Hart. And my kids right now are carpooling because uh, I don't let them walk or, or bike around those areas because they are just not safe. So I will encourage you know, to delay the project, but I understand the funding. Um, I also hear that um, the, the the connection between Las Perlas and San Rafael is going to have two different railroads for, for two different directions. If there's not enough space for a multi-use path, maybe we can have one direction and one multi-use path. So again, um, you know, the most important thing is really the safety of our students and also our community, and I really trust you that you make the right decision. So thank you. Good evening, City Council Mayor. Um, just want to, uh, my name is Mike Keedle. I am the, <coughs> excuse me. I am the interim CEO for the Marin Economic Forum, which is a public-private partnership for the County of Marin. Um, and I just want to also uh, encourage you to to, um, to not delay the construction for the extension for Larkspur. A couple of p purposes that you know that Marin Economic Forum is involved with is that Smart has created both indirectly and directly, a lot of jobs only from Marin, but San Rafael, and they will continue to do so. And secondly, it's really a, a, a long-term solution to get employees of businesses, both from, both from the perspective of getting um, employees out of their cars and into a, a t solution and provide a better traffic opportunity. So thank you for your time. Hi, Elise Leyland, um, San Rafael. First of all, I want to thank Mayor Phillips for bringing this to the forefront. And I've been reading letters in, to the editor in favor of stopping SMART here and not congesting the traffic any further. Um, and I wanted to say that um, I had a letter to the editor, but I couldn't edit it enough to, <laughs> to send it in. Uh, Mike Arnold knows more about this than I do, but Marin County never wanted SMART. In fact, we didn't vote it in. The thing was is that there was this uh, political thing that happened that combined the Sonoma County vote and the Marin County vote. And it was the Sonoma County vote that voted SMART in. Marin County doesn't, <laughs> thank you. Marin County doesn't benefit that much. I, I probably will never, I'll be paying for SMART as long as I live here, but never write it. Um, and also, um, I, uh, Jerry Giacomini, who, is no longer with us, had suggested when they brought up this thing about SMART was to pave over the tracks and to use it for buses. <laughs> and I think that if the ridership doesn't, can't, can't support SMART, they can, people can take buses. And the other thing is, is that if it doesn't support it and it continues to be a boondoggle financially, then it should go away altogether. Thank you. Just so we, we have um, the same set of facts, um, and not, not necessarily to debate your point, but, uh, but Marin County did vote in favor of SMART about 62%. Now, it required for passage 67%, and Sonoma was at about 70%. The combination of the two uh, exceeded the requirement of 67%. But, 
but Marin, just so just so we know, Marin in fact did vote uh, to about 62 point something percent in favor of Smarten. I understand. Hello, I'm Amy Lykover, the interim chair of uh, <clears throat> the Federation of San Rafael Neighborhoods. I'm not here to talk against SMART. I'm here to talk for a safe, efficient, welcoming, and green station area. And you've all received my letter from the Federation. I'm glad to hear that the city is on the same page as we are. You want the same things. I've spoken with Steve Kinsey, and we all agree on the goals. The question is how to get there. Um, I would like you, in your as you uh, ponder the, the heavy questions when it comes to planning, et cetera, I'd like you to take a look at the three alternatives. And what you'll note is that the um, transit center is bigger in the plans than it is now. If you walk around, as many people have suggested, if you walk around the stationary, what I'll call the stationary, and you actually interview the bus drivers, a lot of the buses are not running full at all. And so I urge you, when you consider the situation, how to make it safer, greener, more efficient, and for the children, I teach at, at the high school, um, consider smaller buses, smaller footprint, um, and uh, yeah, we don't, I think that the city can make that decision. We don't own the property at the station area, but think big. Think of what you would like it to look like. This can be the welcoming spot for the city. We could have a whole mission theme down there before it's all bought and sold, and we know a lot of it's going, going, almost gone. So I'd like, I'd love to see the city council take a leadership role in this and say this is what we would like to have at the station area. It doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be not smart. It instead can be intelligent. Thank you. And I see uh, Mr. Mulligan making notes, so <laughs> who knows? Thanks, everybody, for your, for your comments. Uh, there's a lot to consider, as you can, as you can tell. Um, and let me, just, let me just touch on a couple of things that have taken place since our last meeting. Um, last Friday, there was a meeting called by Jared Huffman, our congressman, and attending that meeting were 17 individuals, uh, including Dennis and Nancy from Marin Transit, Golden Gate, uh, obviously the congressman, Damon Connolly was there, Kate uh, uh, Sears was there as the vice president of SMART. Uh, I was there, Bill was there, Jim was there. Um, Mary Beth was there. Mary Beth and I sit on a subcommittee for the city, so the two of us uh, were there. Steve Henninger from MTC was there. Uh, a lot of people with a lot of uh, a lot of muscle and good intentions to talk about this very issue. Uh, Farad Mansurian was there. Uh, here's here's uh, here's a dose of reality. Now you're not going to like this, but reality being such as it is, uh, it's something at least I'm working my way through to assess what we ought to be doing at this point in time. You've heard from our city attorney, and like it or not. Uh, and and uh, we have an extremely uh, knowledgeable and experienced city attorney. And I, for one, and I think collectively we, uh, have a great deal of regard for uh, Rob Epstein's uh, opinion. It's not shooting from the hip, I can guarantee you, uh, but rather you know, knowledgeable and looking at alternatives and trying to sort through some of the things we would uh, perhaps like to see. His conclusion is SMART has the, the rights to proceed to Larkspur. Like it or not, that's the advice that we're getting, and I, I, I rely upon that. Two, you probably know that I sit on the SMART board, and I did attempt, with uh, along with Jim Schutz, our city manager, uh, to convey our concern about proceeding to Larkspur at this point in time. Many of you have that same concern. Uh, frankly, I sit on that board. The board could make a decision to delay it. It would be the board's decision. And that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons I could share with you, but in the interest of time, let me just simply say the votes are not there to prevent uh, SMART under diction of, um, or direction of the, uh, the board. Uh, that delay is not going to take place. So 
I look at the situation and say to myself, okay, what, uh, what, what can we best do as a community to mitigate the consequence of the extension to Larkspur? And I think that's, at least as I see it, that's my job at this point in time. Uh, perhaps the most productive, I think, uh, way to spend uh, the limited amount of time we have to address this issue. And I've, I've come up with three, three points that I'll share with you in, in somewhat generalities because we're still negotiating them as recent as yesterday that I mentioned earlier. So we're not a, it's not a done deal, and I don't want anybody to think that it is, but I'll share with you my thoughts on some of the areas that uh, I've heard and certainly input from council members, and they'll speak for themselves here in a moment. Uh, but the three, the three points I've made is one with regard to the uh, transit center. We have the interim solution, three and a half million bucks. Uh, that's going to be in place to accommodate Golden Gate's buses on, th on five pads that, that uh, are going to be displaced by the tracks going through, the, through basically the center of the transit center. Dennis Mulligan is an outstanding uh, guy, an engineer and smart guy, is, is looking at possibilities that might further reduce that impact. For, but for the moment, at least last Friday, and we're going to meet again Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, um, for this point in time, I've, I've said, and we have an agreement that hasn't been reached yet, but certainly an agreement that says to everybody, everybody now being primarily Golden Gate Transit, but also SMART and Marin, Marin Transit, um, that if we proceed down this path, you have five years to use our streets. It'll take about that amount of time, run EIRs, acquisition of property, uh, building the permanent center. And I've said, um, and the other members, I think, uh, well, they can speak for themselves, but I think they agree, that if that permanent center is not built in five years, then the streets are no longer available to uh, Golden Gate and the other transporters. And so as an incentive for them to uh, do what they want to do, I mean, Dennis will be the first to say, look, we want that up, and uh, we're moving in that direction. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, uh, unrealistic to expect that that uh, will occur, and frankly, that's one of the few levers that we have is, is our streets. So I've said five years to make it real clear that it's their job to go get the money, go make the plan, go build the darn thing. Uh, it's not the city's responsibility, after all. It's their operation and their site. Uh, certainly, we're more than willing to help in any way that we can to make it work as well as we can for the city and also for the operation, but it's it's their operation. So that's the first thing, uh, permanent transit center. Uh, second is multi-use path. I've said for a lot of those within our community, the multi-use path, which going second to uh, Anderson, that is uh, walkway and, 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 and bicycle path, uh, uh, I'll say paralleling or you know closely accompanying the, uh, the smart tracks. Uh, I've said that that, uh, that needs to be done. SMART has agreed, as was cited earlier, to build that. Uh, it's conditional upon two things. One, the EIR. And frankly, I don't know if we're going to get that. I don't know we're not. I just don't know because some people, including FARAD, have said that that's not going to happen. So if it doesn't, frankly, that's a little bit out of our hands. But we're pushing pretty hard as, you know, as Eric and, you know, around the room, Patrick certainly, um, are pushing to get the, uh, uh, the multi-use path in place because I think it's important for the city and, and I'd like to see that uh, in a big way. Three, to help mitigate this as much as at least I've come up with and certainly welcome your, your input. Uh, three, it seems to me that if the ridership from San Rafael to Larkspur is, uh, is fairly... Um, I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to, as Richard did, characterize as 231 by 2035. It's, it's going to be a, some number. I don't know what it is. None of us do. But let's assume for the moment that it's not an overwhelming number. So my question of SMART is, and it's their call, but what we have in an agreement that we're working on, not, not agreed upon yet, but what I'm trying to get is something that says if four, I'll just make this simple, if four trains come into San Rafael and there's not a huge ridership going to Larkspur, why not take one of those four to Larkspur, interrupting second and third once instead of four times? So we're trying to mitigate the consequence in that way as well. And I think my job, our job, is to realize the, the reality of the situation. It was, you know, you're going to hear this voted, and there are various, you know, uh, people that will say, well, no, not really. Well, guess what? It, it took place. Uh, your vote has consequences. And so my job, our job, I think, is to make this work as best we can, 
Now, you've heard a lot about the negative aspects, and, and I think several of you also pointed out that there are certainly real opportunities for this area. If we have some vision and uh, ask ourselves what we want it to look like, how we want to change it, an entrance way to the, to the city, and quite frankly, that's one of the reasons why we've asked uh, Steve Kennedy to help. He's got a pretty good uh, imagination and vision, and, and we're working on not just a plunking down a transit center, but rather something that is going to be more inviting to our city and I think uh, more functional in a lot of ways. So we're we're looking at two things. One, if this has to go and it appears that it has to, well, how do we reduce the impact as much as possible? And then two, trying to look at this in a positive sense and what do we, uh, what can we do to really make it a, a strong attribute for, for our city? So those are the things I'm working on. Uh, random comments, quiet zone, Petaluma doesn't have it coming on uh, April 9th. We're, we're miles ahead of any other city along this track. We started this thing two years ago. I had to, I had to raise a point with regard to uh, fellow, uh, fellow uh, board members of SMART to say we're coming uh, out with these quiet zones. We're working on them, working on them pretty hard. Janet was instrumental, as was Ken, uh, to get us uh, moving in the right direction, which we've done. As you know, we also were asked by, by Novato to take the lead on, on theirs because they didn't do it quite right for whatever reason. I, you know, I don't know. I, I sort of know, but let's say for whatever reason. So we're a mile ahead of everybody else, folks. We're not behind the eight ball in this quiet zone thing. I promise you that. Um, just one little thing. I went to the dentist yesterday, and the, and the person that was helping with a little tooth issue I had was Liz in Petaluma, and she was saying, you know, uh, I can't wait, and most of my neighbors that are coming in this direction can't wait, wait to, kinda, to ride the train to San Rafael. This is going to be a good thing for San Rafael. Now, there's good and bad and how you balance this. Each of us will do that in our own separate ways. But uh, San Rafael is going to benefit, and you can, you can measure for yourself whether or not it's offset by some of the issues we've talked about. But we, San Rafael is going to benefit uh, by this train coming to San Rafael. Now, whether or not we benefit go by going to Larkspur, I've said I don't think so, but that's to be seen. But as a city, we are going to benefit. I've rambled on and chastised everybody else for going over two minutes, so let me turn the mic over. Um, so I'll just start with um, to address one of the questions that was early on, and, and Bill and, and Jim and um, Rob, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we do have control of the West Francisco. That is our street. And one of the speakers said, well, why don't we just not do that and, and see what happens? Um, paraphrasing. Well, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we don't do that, SMART still has a right-of-way um, on the existing tracks. The flip wouldn't go into place and they would continue to go. So that wouldn't necessarily delay them going to Larkspur. Um, there are two paths. We, we're trying to figure out by them going to Larkspur what is going to be the least impactful overall in terms of not just during the construction phase but going forward. And that West Francisco flip um, uh, seems to address some of those situations. But if we were to say with our right as owning those streets, no, you can't do that. You are not going to flip Francisco. It doesn't prevent them, and it, it wouldn't even stop them from proceeding along their lines. They could go ahead and say, we're just going to go along the existing right of way, and it's ours, um, so we're going to go ahead and do that. I am correct in that assumption? Okay. Um, so, um, you know, this is – this. It's something that we're all very concerned about, and we've got to find a way to address – everyone's concerns and and we and we really appreciate the fact that everybody has attended tonight in the previous sessions so that we can hear from you um, I also wanted to address some of the comments that I've read over the over the last couple of months on calling out the City Council and calling out the, the members up here as to comments such as we've known about this for 10 years why is it taking so why is it taking so long to finally address this well just to refresh everyone's memory smart didn't have the funding for the extension to Larkspur up until about 18 months ago so as you know there are a lot of a lot of requirements on the cities to run on a daily basis we get comments of why are the potholes not fixed um, what's what's going to be the next thing that we need to address and so it wasn't until they received this funding um, that we knew that the extension was even going to be happening anytime soon. Up until that point, it was 
a second phase to be determined later. So our task, and we've been assigned as, as city council members, is to address the issues that are in front of us at the time. It's not that we didn't know that at some point this would was going to happen, but we address it. We address the situations that are in front of us and work forward. So we, the second, the absolute second that we knew that funding was secured and the plans were were starting to move forward from downtown Santa Fe to Larkspur, I've never seen people move in government as quickly as the folks here have have moved to address the issues as best we can. People have spent countless amount of hours um, looking and trying to minimize the impact on the citizens of San Rafael. So I want everybody, I want it out there because a lot of information gets gets thrown out there and it's, and, and we're not, you know, it, it's, it, it, it hurts kind of sometimes to think that people think that we're not doing anything, that we're not concerned about this, that we're citizens of San Rafael. We make the drive all the time. We, we cross the intersections just like you folks, and that's why we're here listening to, to all of your concerns because of the, a lot of the same concerns that we have. But I wanted to make it clear that since the funding was secured, we have been on this trying to find the best way to make this work. And it's not perfect. We know that. Um, but we hope that with your input, with the input from other council members, from the input of staff, that we're able to mitigate as much of the challenges that we're going to be facing. I'm not saying it's a done deal. There's still a lot of stuff that we're working on. But I just wanted to get that out in my comments. I just want to echo um, Councilmember Gamble's um, thanks and gratitude to all of you coming out and, and bringing your issues um, forward. I know only too well on um, how this is going to impact San Rafael. Um, but I want to turn around a little bit on, on the, on the multi-use path. I totally support the multi-use path. There's been all kinds of work going on um, here behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, trying to make it happen. I would like to, I know there are a lot of people in this audience that um, either know somebody who has influence over funding decisions or themselves have uh, funding decisions that they make. And I would like to call everyone to action on getting those last two million dollars of funding together for that multi-use path. Because folks, as, as you've heard, it's kind of now or never. Um, and it's time to really roll up the sleeves and wring out every dollar that we can find to get that multi-use path done. Um, on the broader of uh, the, the train, um, there's one member of the audience that needs to roll up his sleeves, um, and that's our um, representative of Golden Gate Transit. Um, I'm really hopeful that that negotiation with SMART will go well and that we can get um, a, a serious path forward to get the funding that we need to put together not just a transit center, I want an intermodal connectivity center. I want the people getting off of Grace's bu uh, buses to be able to get into whatever their next mode of transportation is and, and that we can deal with the, the new types of uh, vehicles we're going to be having, you know, self-driving cars and whatever. I want something that's really uh, able to make transportation in San Rafael a seamless um, uh, movement. So I, I'm thinking big. So um, I, I don't want just a, just a, the plain old transit center, although I do really adore the transit center because I use it every day. Thank you. I wanted to build a little bit on something the mayor had talked about in terms of um, his representation of the city at the SMART. And just so everyone here is clear, there was a letter that he and our city manager put forward to SMART and to ask for it to be put on the agenda for a discussion, and it wasn't. He didn't say that, but um, San Rafael is representing and trying to do what we can. And the reality is, he, he talked about reality. Um, sometimes you try to do something like that, and, and if they can't put it on the agenda, then it's going to be really hard to have that discussion at the SMART board. And I, I'm so grateful that everyone came out here tonight to talk to us. And I kept thinking it would be great if some of these conversations actually happened at the SMART meeting as well, right? Because you, we're talking and representing our city, um, but the mayor is just one vote on that board. So um, just wanted to share that. Um, there was a lot of assumption tonight that San Rafael has control over where the extension, the actual train running, whether it goes forward or not. I think the mayor answered that very clearly, as did our city attorney, that in terms of the train going back and forth, we don't have any direct control over that. What we have control over is the ancil ancillary, ancillary factors. Councilmember Gamblin already asked about the flip. Um, 
really the train would keep going. I would love to ask if we didn't do the interim, if we said, okay, you know what, this is the one thing, the ancillary factor that we control, what would happen if we said no to that? Because I think that's a question that's been asked over and over. It would be nice to have a clear answer because there does get misinformation out there. I read next door too, so I, I know that that does happen. Um, and then my only other question was, and I thought this was interesting, when we talk about delay, again, the mayor was very clear. It's the smart board that would vote on giving a delay if that was appropriate. They believed it was appropriate. And someone had asked a question in terms of the funding. Um, the funding has driven a lot of this. Who would ask for the extension on the funding? I, I don't think that San Rafael would be the, the, the appropriate. I don't even know who would give that kind of um, permission. And I'm just, I'm curious because I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, if there's a way to delay that funding but ensure that it doesn't go away because we're not sure about, uh, we need that federal funding going forward. So those are really uh, the two questions that came out with, sorry, it wasn't just comments, but I would love to have more answers on that. Well, I can help with that. Uh, good, good question, certainly. Um, I mentioned that last uh, Friday uh, we met with a congressman, we being 17 others, um, and preceding that and also accompanying, not accompanying, but in response to our letter to SMART, uh, our congressman did respond on the funding, that is the $40 million. And he was uh, pretty clear and adamant that if there is a significant delay in the use of the 40 that's presently available, 20 from the feds and 20 from MTC, that money would be lost. And therefore, there would be no, certainly no guarantee that uh, the extension would uh, be in place. Now, for some, that would be good news. But for others, that's, that's kind of stupid because there's $40 million to complete this to get us to Larkspur, Larkspur and then perhaps on to San Francisco. So the concern that he has, uh, and I, 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 I've got quite a bit of trust uh, in our congressman. Uh, I know him well, and we get along, and he's, he's pretty honorable. Well, not scratch the pretty part, particularly since it's televised. He is honorable, in my view. Um, I think that's probably a fair read. Uh, we all know what's happened uh, in Washington, and uh, California is probably not high on Trump's uh, best best friend list. And transportation money is uh, pretty fungible; it can be moved around pretty easily. So I, I I'm convinced that if we don't proceed, and more importantly. Our smart board is convinced, uh, transportation uh, folks that really know what they're talking about are convinced that money will, in fact, uh, uh, be lost to, to this area. And actually, I actually have one more um, comment. This is just to get information on our city website, which is new and redesigned. If you haven't gone to it yet, it's awesome. If you go into the uh, search bar and put in smart, we do have a page there where we're trying to put in all this information. So the, uh, the, the mayor's and city manager's letter is on there. The response from smart, which outlines, uh, you know, we're really point by point, that's on there too. Um, and I really encourage you to look at that because that's the information that we're getting directly and it's uh, great for all of you to have access to that. I want to just, uh, just mention one more thing and then it's nine o'clock and uh, we'll thank you once again. Here's, uh, here's the reality with, uh, with Anderson Drive. Uh, the city of San Rafael is obligated uh, under a court uh, uh, direction that council member, a uh, vice mayor, uh, Bushy is quite aware of. She wrote it. And we are, we are <laughs> David knows all about this. We are on the hook to make it uh, uh, the train first priority if there is one to run through there. And guess what? That is what SMART's all about. And um, right now, we have an application before PUC for uh, the approval to, to transverse uh, Anderson Drive. And the part of the deal is that it's at 15 miles an hour. And that's an accommodation by SMART. They probably don't get much credit for it, but it's an accommodation. Because certainly, you could go through there much faster than that. Um, in which case, PUC would probably say, no, that's not, uh, that's not safe. So therefore, we're not going to allow it. And therefore, San Rafael has two choices uh, that I see anyway. And they are, one, uh, come up with $25 million to go over or under. Uh, there's one other approach, but that's $10 million, So it's somewhere between 10 and $20 million, let's say. Um, or we could close Anderson Drive. Now, we've got 20,000 cars going to Anderson. That's not a real good uh, choice. So to some degree, we need to keep Anderson Drive in place 
with fingers crossed regarding the uh, the PUC uh, approval. So if we had, frankly, get too heavy-handed with Smart, they're going to say, forget it, we're not going to do the flip. We're going straight to Anderson, and guess what we're going through there at 30 miles an hour. Now, that's, that's just my characterization. I have no idea what they would say, um, but my suspicion is they might say that, and I don't know that. But that's not a good outcome for San Rafael. I mean, I've been keeping my eye on that dug on Anderson now for a couple of years, uh, and so it's a little hard to get pretty, uh, pretty heavy-handed with, with Smart, knowing that we've got this, this cleaver over our heads known as Anderson Drive. So take that into consideration when you weigh all this stuff. I know we will. And, um, and so with that, John, oh. You have a comment? No, Andrew has a comment. Andrew has a it's after 9 o'clock, and everyone else up here has said more eloquently than I my sentiments, so I'm going to desist. Mr. Mayor, that's fine. 